I'm really happy to be here. Is my mic on, Tom? Yes? Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what wasn't mentioned is, um, or was mentioned, but maybe I'd like to say a little more about it, is that when I wrote Emotional Intelligence, I was really arguing for a certain kind of education, an education that looked at the, the whole student, the emotional and social developmental lines, as well as the cognitive and academic. And today, I'm going to share with you the crucial role that I think principals can play in helping that happen in schools throughout the country. I should say I'm here in Washington with my, um, I'm here in Washington with my daughter-in-law and my 10-year-old grandson. They're over looking at the Declaration of Independence or maybe at the Smithsonian, I don't know, but it's, this is a, a city which it itself is educational. Now, Isaiah, the 10-year-old, he's going into fifth grade. He's very lucky. He goes to a school in Massachusetts that year after year has the highest math and science achievement scores uh, of any school throughout the state. But what's interesting is this town is not a wealthy town. It's in the hills of Massachusetts. Uh, the, the parents there are not more highly educated than anywhere else. But if you ask anyone in town why that school is so good, they'll tell you, it's the principal. They've had the same principal for 17 years. She just retired, but she has set the tone. She has made it the kind of place that kids love going to. I've had now, this is the fourth grandchild in that school. They all loved it. And I think that speaks to why principles matter so much to children and their learning. And I want to fill in the blanks in that equation. But before I do, I also want to say a, a thanks, belated thanks to my own elementary school teachers, to uh, Mrs. Schur, first and second grade, Mrs. Cooper, third grade, Miss Wiedersheim, fourth grade, Mr. Ryan, fifth grade, Mr. Maxwell, sixth grade. I still remember, it's more than a half century and I still remember them. But who I really remember is Mr. Scott, the principal. He was the, the invisible man behind it all. And now that I've looked at the brain science and the social science, I see that it's the principles that are actually key, actually pivotal. It was um, at my 20th high school reunion. I grew up in a small city in the farming region of California, the Central Valley. It was my 20th high school reunion that I first realized how important the other side of the equation, emotional intelligence is for everything we do, including learning. Uh, and it started with realizing who the most successful kid in my class was 20 years out. It wasn't the valedictorian, actually. It wasn't the kid with the highest SAT scores. It was um, a guy I'd known pretty well through most of my childhood. He's, he's really a wonderful person. He was the kind of person that made you feel at ease, that you had fun with, who listened, who cared. 20 years later, he was the senior vice president of the largest cable TV company in America. Now this was when cable TV, you have to imagine, cable TV was the hot industry back then. This was a while ago. And um, that was a little eye-opening. Then at our 40th reunion, I got the rest of the story. He had formed his own cable TV company, he was the CEO. He sold it at the top of the market. This was when there were tops to markets. This is also back then. And uh, now he lives on a golf course in Florida. Now, I don't know about where you're from, but where I'm from, that's considered success. So why is it that this kid who was, he was a good enough student, but not the best, but he really ended up doing very well in life. Then I went to, I uh, got another eye opener. This was back in college. I went to a very competitive school, hard to get into, and there was a kid there who had uh, perfect scores on his SAT. The reason I was admitted was diversity, quote. Back then, that meant a kid who didn't know what a prep school was and who was from a public high school in a farm town. So this guy had perfect scores 
on his SAT, perfect scores in three AP classes, but uh, he had a problem. The problem was he could not get out of bed before noon. He never went to class. He never finished his assignments. It took him about eight years to get his bachelor's degree. That guy was brilliant, but he had a deficit in emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is how we handle ourselves and how we handle our relationships. It's very simple. It sounds simple. It's not so simple. And it's absolutely crucial to a child's ability to succeed in school and to succeed in life, to succeed in relationships. Let me make that case for you. I'll start by sharing with you some data was um, collected, inspired by a professor I had in graduate school who back in the 70s wrote a very controversial article in American Psychologist. It's a leading psychology journal. He said, if you want to hire someone for a job, any job, principal, CEO, doesn't matter, don't look at their grades. Don't look at their IQ scores. Don't look at their personality profile. Instead, look in your own organization, say your school, at people who've held that position in the past or hold it now, and look at those who are in the top 10% by whatever metric makes sense for that job. Compare them to people who are only average, and then do a systematic analysis of what makes the stars so good. It's called competence modeling. It's done now in most world-class organizations. After emotional intelligence, I looked at competence models from about 200 organizations. These are usually proprietary, not shared. Uh, they're done by companies, for example, to find out who we want to hire, who we want to promote, who are our high potential leaders, and so on. And what it showed is if you compare abilities that are purely cognitive, IQ, technical skills, and so on, versus abilities that are based on how we handle ourselves and how we handle our relationships, emotional intelligence, for jobs at every level, if you look at the distinguishing abilities, see that blue line at the bottom? That's the difference between threshold abilities. Threshold abilities are what you need to get the job and hold the job to be a teacher or a principal. You need an IQ about a standard deviation above norm, above the average IQ score. Uh, that's a threshold ability. Once you're in the game, though, the question is who emerges as the outstanding teacher? Who emerges as the outstanding principal? And that turns out not to be predicted by IQ. It's predicted by your relationships and how you conduct yourself. So if you look higher and higher in the organization, it matters more and more for distinguishing competencies at every level. It's twice as important as cognitive abilities. And at the very highest level, it's about 80 to 90% of the competencies that organizations independently find distinguish their stars. So this 15% is interesting. That is actually what could be called systems thinking, big picture thinking, um, understanding, for example, how a decision over here is going to matter five years down the road or uh, how it'll ramify through an organization. That lets you get a strategic vision, but once you have that, you can only fulfill that vision through people. You have to inspire, you have to listen, you have to communicate, you have to influence, and those are all emotional intelligence abilities. Essentially, your emotional state, your ability to handle your emotions, determines how well you can think and learn. I'll go into that in more detail, but organizations around the world are realizing that now, and as they're realizing it, they're also seeing there is a very big problem. And the problem is that the mechanism through which we do this has not had an upgrade in about 100,000 years. The human brain, this little bit of neuroscience. By the way, I see some people having to leave occasionally. When I was reminiscing about my grammar school, it occurred to me that there was something pretty cool we used to do back then. That was when you had to go to the lavatory, you'd raise your hand with bunny ears. So you don't have to raise your hand with bunny ears, but feel free to come and go as need be. We're going to have about an hour together here. Now, um, speaking of which, 
I need to have a time check with whoever in this room can speak f to this. Deborah, are you here? No. Deborah, yes. I was told I should speak for 75 minutes, but the monitor here is at 35. What? It's 45? Ha, 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 ha. Are you kidding me? It's 45. Well, that's interesting. OK, I'll talk really fast. I'm going to skip a couple of things. So this is the brain. <laughs> and uh, the prefrontal area is really important for school because this is where you learn. This is where you comprehend. However, the problem with that is it is very connected to the area in yellow, that's the emotional brain. And the brain was designed to help us survive and help us survive threats. So there's a powerful area, the amygdala, that's the radar for threat. Right now, your amygdala is asking, as it's asked through human history, am I safe? If it thinks it's not, we're not safe, it triggers what's called an emotional hijack. You get very angry, you get very scared. All negative emotions are triggered by the amygdala. And when the amygdala is triggered, it paralyzes the prefrontal area, the part of the brain that learns. So if you have a classroom where kids are in an amygdala hijack state, then what's going to happen is that they won't be able to take in what the teacher is saying to them. It's that simple. So Part of the task of a teacher is helping kids handle their amygdala so that they can pay full attention and take in what they're saying. Part of a principal's task is helping teachers help their kids do that. And one way to understand this is knowing what the triggers are. There are these, these are typical triggers, uh, feeling a lack of respect or not being treated fair or unappreciated, not being listened to, feeling unfairly criticized or blamed. But let's think about teachers. I just saw data from a national survey where it shows that about 60% of teachers feel they're under great stress. 20 years ago, it was about 35. And the most common triggers are things like managing misbehaving students, motivating students who don't care, having an overwhelming workload, a lack of control over decisions that affect them, little time to relax and recover. So stress impairs a teacher's well-being and cognitive functioning. So another way to think about this is the, this is a function that's been known in psychology for about 100 years, Yerkes-Dodds relationship between performance and arousal, physiological arousal levels. And what it shows is if you're not interested, if you're bored, and these are the kids looking out the window, or maybe they have a little video game under their desk, whatever, they're not into what's going on in the classroom, they're not learning. And then over to the far right, you have uh, people who are highly stressed, people who are in a state that is actually called technically frazzle, where you never recover. You have constant ongoing amygdala hijacks. And that is the very worst. This is what leads to teacher burnout. Where you want people to be is at the height uh, of that performance arc, the optimal zone, one way to measure this, by the way, a technical way, has to do with stress hormones. When we're under stressed, when we're not interested, when we're under motivated, we have two low levels of what are called cortisol and adrenaline or epinephrine. That's what the amygdala triggers. If we have an optimal level, if we're really into it, really interested, really engaged, this is where students learn at their best and teachers teach at their best. But if it's too high, then we're overwhelmed and it shuts down that prefrontal area. That's the, the basic uh, relationship. But then there's a question of what can you do about it? What, how can you help teachers get and stay in that state? There's a couple of tips. Flow is sometimes what that optimal state is called. It's a state of 
maximal neural harmony, maximal cognitive efficiency. So one way to do it is to create a cocoon where people can focus on their work without interruptions, having clear goals, what teachers need to accomplish, but letting them be free to get there in their own way. And then also giving feedback, but when you give feedback, this is very important, you, it's important not to focus on the negative, but to talk about people's strengths and abilities. Otherwise, it's, it's very, it, it becomes an amygdala trigger. And then match the challenge to a person's skill set. This is what teachers need to do with their students, of course, and maybe you can do with your principals. One of the weapons that you have, not weapons, but maybe tools is a better word for doing this, uh, is, has to do with brain function. This is the new discovery of what's called the social brain. The social brain is in the forebrain, the front part of the brain. It's a new discovery. Uh, only in the last five, 10 years, neuroscientists stopped looking at one brain and one body and one person, started looking at two brains and two bodies while two people interacted. And um, they discovered that there were circuits they didn't even know existed. The first discovery was by accident. In Italy, in a lab, they're studying the motor neuron of a, in a monkey. All it did was fire when that monkey raised its arm. Never did anything any other time. One afternoon, the monkey's sitting there not moving and the neuron is firing. No one knows what's going on. Then they realize it was a hot day. A lab assistant went out for a gelato. He's standing in front of the monkey and every time he raises his arm to take a lick, the monkey neuron for that same movement fires. This is the discovery of what are called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons pepper the human brain and they help us understand instantly, unconsciously, automatically what's going on with the other person, what they're feeling, what they're doing, what they're intending, and it keeps our interaction smooth and on the same page. So the social brain, the social circuitry of the brain is designed so two brains and two people interacting lock and create a separate stream, an unconscious stream of connection, which is the basis of feeling like we're in rapport. There are three ingredients to rapport. The first is full mutual attention. If you don't have that, you're not gonna have rapport. Well, think about it. The rules for attention have changed. They've shifted because of technology. In 2007, Time Magazine had an article. It said there's a new word in the English language. The word is pizzled. It's a combination of puzzled and pissed off. And it's how you feel when the person you're with takes out their Blackberry and starts talking to someone else. That was, two, that was eight years ago, nine years ago. Now, well, first of all, they said Blackberry, so we know it's, that was then. But what happens is now nobody blinks. I've, I've had to tell, uh, you know, kids, when you speak to someone, you should put down your phone. So it's, the, in other words, how we relate to each other is being intruded upon by our technology and distractions, you know, multitasking is a total fiction. People say, well, I multitask. The truth is the brain doesn't multitask. It switches very quickly from one thing to another. And when you go back to the thing you're concentrating on, it takes you a long while to ramp up again to the same focus. So focus and attention is very important and you won't have rapport without it. The second sign of rapport is that if you look at two people who are really having chemistry and interaction, you made a video and watched the video without the sound, it looked like their bodies were orchestrated. There's this automatic uh, response that happens to people. And it's done by what are called oscillators, a different part of the social brain. Oscillators determine, for example, when someone puts their hand out to shake your hand, you receive it in the right way because of your oscillators. Think about it, oscillators are crucial to the survival of the human race. At the moment of a first kiss, they determine the speed at which two skulls come together. If they got that velocity wrong, we would have no future generation, I'm sure. 
So the second sign is this nonverbal orchestration, and the third is that it feels good. If you go back, let me just uh, go back to this other. If you go back to this arc, the phenomenological sign of optimal performance are a couple of things. One is concentration is 100%. Another is people don't feel any self-consciousness. They're totally confident about how they're doing. They're very flexible. They can respond to changing demands. And it feels good. This is one of the characteristics of this flow in op of the zone in sports. So when it comes to the social brain, the key sign of rapport is that it felt good. We had a good time together. So rapport is not just in one-to-one. -one. Rapport occurs in the classroom. Rapport occurs when students are learning at their best and teachers are teaching at their best because they're in that optimal state. So what does this have to do with principles? Well, consider this. There are studies that have been done with teams and a school is a team and principal's the head of the team. And it turns out, the Yale School of Management tells us, that if the leader is in a very negative mood, people on the team catch that mood and their performance goes down. If the leader is in a very positive, enthusiastic mood, then the people on the team catch that mood and the performance goes up. This nonverbal channel is extremely important if people get negative performance feedback, and really positive, warm, upbeat, supportive tone of voice, they come out feeling pretty good about that negative feedback. If they get positive feedback, a very cold, aloof, distant voice, they come out feeling pretty bad about positive feedback. So how you do what you do is very important to how people take it and what happens inside of them. So classroom teachers, I don't have to tell you, are more stressed than ever. There was an article that's about to be published. It's in press. Researchers at the University of British Columbia looked at that stress hormone level I told you about. They looked at it in, in teachers, and they found out that when teachers were feeling highly stressed, their levels were very up, very high, but so were the levels in their students. These are second graders, fourth graders. In other words, in any human group, it's just natural that you pay most attention to and put most importance on what the most powerful person that group says and does. The leader, the principal for teachers is the sender of emotion. The teacher for students is the same. So you have a contained system in a school where the principal sets the tone for the teachers and the teachers set the tone for the students at an unconscious, instantaneous, biological level which feeds back into how well they can learn. So the question is, how can you help teachers be in the best state to learn? And that's where emotional intelligence comes in. There are four parts to emotional intelligence in, in my model. There's how well you can tune into yourself, know what you're feeling, why you're feeling it, how it impacts what you do. Uh, and then there is, oh, part of that also, by the way, is knowing what you're really good at and what you could improve on. The next is self-management because how well you tune into yourself determines whether or not, for example, you notice that you're about to have an emotional hijack. The signs of emotional hijack are three. You have a very strong emotional response. It's very sudden. And the third is when the dust settles, you wish you had not done or said that thing. I'm sure it's never happened to you. You're all principals, you know. <laughs> it happens to every, it happens to me. So an emotional hijack builds, and if you're aware, you can notice the sensations, the signals that it's building, and do something to prevent an explosion or, or the, the peak. And self-management, as I'll explain in a bit, also has to do with how you, well you motivate yourself. Social awareness really comes down to empathy, how well you can tune in to the other person, 
how well you can understand them. And if you're tuned out of a range of your own experience, you won't be able to tune into the other person as well. And then uh, you put all that together in handling relationships. So the good news is all of these abilities are learned and learnable at any point in life. Based on each of these four domains, there are specific competencies we've identified that mark outstanding leaders in any kind of organization. So let, let me just review these for you in a little detail. Emotional self-awareness is understanding your own emotions and so how they affect your performance. This emotional self-control, really it should say emotional balance. It's not like inhibiting emotion. You need your positive emotions, but it's keeping your disruptive emotions and impulses in check and being effective under stress. Adaptability, that's pretty self-evident. It's flexibility in juggling multiple demands, whatever, uh, whatever the pressures are of the moment. The achievement, that's really important. It's having a goal and being able to work toward that goal. And this requires uh, being able to think about how good you will feel when you get to that goal. And then there's a positive outlook. I mean, problems happen, stuff occurs, but when it does, the question is, can you see the bright side? Can you see how it might work out? Empathy, I'm gonna go into that in a little more detail in just a, a bit, but it's basically the ability to understand how the other person thinks and feels. Organizational awareness is really important for a principal because it's both downward in the school and outward in the district. It's understanding, for example, who to influence to get a decision made that you need that's gonna affect how well, uh, for example, your school can operate, maybe a budget or so on. Then relationship management. Well, being inspiring, that's the core of leadership. That means articulating a shared mission from the heart to the heart in the way that really resonates with people. Influence, being able to articulate a point of view and in a way which resonates with people. It's also having a positive impact on other people. And I think for principals, that's always very important that you have a positive impact. Conflict management, it means surfacing conflicts, not waiting till they explode, and coming up with a solution that satisfies parties, and then teamwork, working with others toward a shared goal. I mean, a school is a team. There's no question about that. So let me drill down a little bit in each of these competencies. The self-awareness, uh, I have a friend who grew up uh, in the next town over from me in the Central Valley. He's, he's in a good example of self-awareness. Uh, he was actually a terrible student, almost flunked out of high school, but he went to a community college and managed to uh, somehow took a course in film that he did very well at, he realized he loved it, got into a film school, and his student film caught the eye of a director who gave him a job as a production assistant he did so well that they let him make a film, the studio gave money for, of a script that he'd written in, in uh, school. To everyone's surprise, that movie did really well. And uh, the problem for him was that the studio had the last cut and he felt they'd, they ruined his movie. So he said, I'm gonna take my money from that movie and make another one and I'm not gonna let a studio have final cut. I'm an artist, it's my creative product. Uh, he went off on his own, made this other movie, ran out of money, but he finally got a loan at the end. And the movie, um, it might, you might have seen it's called Star Wars. <laughs> so George Lucas has high self-awareness in the sense that self-awareness also puts you in touch with your guiding values. It's a way of understanding this feels right, doesn't feel right. And it's not just about controlling emotions, but it's about living a life that's meaningful for you. And uh, that's exactly what he did. It has to do with what a friend of mine from graduate school, Howard Gardner at Harvard, uh, calls good work. Good work puts together three things. 
what you are good at doing, your excellence, what you love doing, what engages you, and what has meaning or what fulfills your sense of purpose, your ethics. So if you align excellence, engagement, and ethics, you have good work. Good work always puts people in that optimal state because it's what you love doing and you're good at. But the question is, how much of what I do in my day or my week is good work? What could I do so that it's a bigger proportion? How can I help other people get there? Good work is work that feels good. Then there, whoops, how did I get that? Oh, 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 sorry. You'll just excuse me, me and my slides are having a conversation here. <laughs> okay, let's talk about three kinds of empathy. There, each of these kinds of empathy is instantiated in a different part of the brain. Uh, cognitive empathy is cortical, and it means that you can take another person's perspective. You know what their mental models are. You know how they think about things, and you can put things in terms they understand makes you a great communicator. Emotional, that's what the other person feels. You know what they feel because you feel it. It's social brain connectivity. It's instantaneous. And then the final part, empathic concern, is I actually care about the other person. The empathic concern circuitry is the same as the mammalian caretaking circuitry. It's a parent's love for their children. But the question is, can we expand that to other people? Can we care about the people we work with in the same way we care about our children? To the extent you do, you can be a very caring leader. And this is someone who accepts and values people without harsh criticisms, sees the potential in the person, gives helpful feedback rather than just dismissing them. It's calm under pressure. You don't have emotional hijacks, so you manage them or you recover very quickly. You listen actively and you dialogue. You don't just say, do it because I'm the boss. You're accessible and approachable. You ask questions, you engage. These are the things that leaders who have that kind of empathy, who really care. It's not just that I know what you think and feel. I want to help you out. This is the kind of leadership that lets someone do their best. This is the kind of leadership that lets a teacher teach at their best. Let me go back to this uh, remains calm under pressure, no emotional hijacks. That has to do with self-management emotional balance. I'd like to share with you uh, a method for doing this. I'll give you the, the quick version. If you just uh, sit up straight, put your pen aside and close your eyes and bring your attention to your breath. Don't try to control your breath. Just notice your breath. Are you breathing in? Are you breathing out? Stay with your breath. The full in-breath, the full out-breath. If your mind wanders and you notice it wandered, just bring it back to your breath. Start with the next one. Now you can open your eyes. That was the shortest version of what's called mindfulness you'll ever see. Usually people do this for 10 minutes. They just published an article that says, for example, if you're multitasking, you know, that degrades concentration. But if you take a 10 minute break for mindfulness, it restores it. Mindfulness turns out to help people recover more quickly from stress, helps them attune to the building of that uh, amygdala hijack I was telling you about. So that's, that's a very useful tool. It's a part of an internal toolkit, and it's become more and more popular. I was in a school in Spanish Harlem, second graders, 
and uh, half the kids in this class are special needs. The kids all grew up in the housing project next door, a very traumatic childhood. I thought the class would be really chaotic. It was very calm and focused, and I asked the teacher why. She said, watch this. Every day, we have a session called Belly Buddies. In Belly Buddies, every child goes to their cubby one by one, takes their favorite stuffed animal, finds a place to lie down on a carpet, puts an animal on their belly, watches it rise on the in-breath, fall on the out-breath, rise on the in-breath, fall on the out-breath. It's the same thing we just did, but for, for seven-year-olds. And the result is that they're more focused and more calm, and it's true at every age. So this, uh, this is an attentional skill building exercise, but it turns out that the circuitry that you're strengthening, this is like a rep in the mental gym, the circuitry you're strengthening serves many tasks, many functions in the brain. It also helps you manage upsetting emotions. So it's a twofer. So teaching this to kids helps them strengthen circuitry that's developing anyway. The circuitry is for what's called cognitive control, the ability to pay attention and to put aside or manage your impulses and distress. There was a study done in New Zealand of a thousand kids who were followed from four to eight. They were measured on cognitive control. Do you know the marshmallow test? It's done with four-year-olds. It's rather famous. Uh, at Stanford, one by one, kids in the preschool were brought in sat down at a small table, a big marshmallow put in front of them, and they're told, you can have it now if you want, but if you don't eat it now, you can have two when I get back from an errand, and then experiment or leaves the room. This is a predicament that tries the soul of any four-year-old, I assure you. Some of them go up and sniff it and then jump back like it was a dangerous object. Some kids can't stand it, they just gobble it on the spot. So, in New Zealand, they did the marshmallow tests and several other tests of cognitive control, this ability. And then they tracked the kids down when they're in their 30s, and they found that cognitive control predicted their financial success and their health better than their IQ in childhood and better than the wealth of the family they grew up in. In other words, it's a way to level the playing field for kids. And it's part of a a, a series of programs I want to talk about called social emotional learning, which teach kids emotional intelligence abilities in a developmentally appropriate way and do it from K through 12. Many of you may have this in, in schools. Um, in the school that my grandchildren went to, it, it's called Second Step. Anyone here have Second Step in their school? That's a popular one. There are about 100 of these now but they all have the same goal, which is helping kids learn these abilities along with academic subjects. The best programs are woven into the curriculum. They don't take much time. It's like five minutes of belly buddies a day. Uh, and at different levels, you teach it differently. Sometimes it's uh, a uh, stoplight. Stoplight is a poster in a classroom. It says, when you're getting upset, remember the stoplight. Red light, stop, calm down, think before you act. Yellow light, think of a range of ways you might respond. Green light, pick the best one, try it out. That teaches the same ability, to think before you act. There's a definition of maturity as widening the gap between impulse and action, and that should be a goal of education just as well as, you know, algebra, uh, from my point of view. There's a program for teachers uh, that was, it's about to be published, where they, in, they had five in-service days and they taught these abilities like how to manage emotions, mindfulness of the breath like you just did. And uh, what they found was that uh, their stress levels went way, way down. They're sleeping better. They felt they were less pressured, better able to handle students misbehaving. And they had a better classroom climate. This is, uh, I think, one of the best ways to intervene in this phenomenon of new teachers dropping out. About 40 to 50% of teachers within the first three years quit. And it's because of the buildup of stress and emotional exhaustion leading to burnout. 
and uh, these are the kinds of programs I think would help. There's one thing you can do to expand your circle of caring. I think maybe I'll show you what it is. It, you're gonna have to sit up and close your eyes again. But it's kind of a, a mental exercise in caring where you bring to mind first people that have been very caring toward you in your life and you think about how kind they were to you, you feel the gratitude, and you wish that they, if they're still around, that they be happy and healthy and have a meaningful, rich life. And then you think about yourself and you wish for yourself the same. I be safe and happy and healthy. I be free from suffering. I have a life of ease and well-being. And then you think about people you naturally love, the people in your family, the people close to you. And you wish them the same thing, that they be safe and happy and healthy, free from suffering, have a life of ease and well-being. Then you think about people you know, but you aren't particularly close to, to even strangers. And you wish the same for them. May you be safe, happy, healthy, free from suffering. May you have a life of ease and well-being. Then you do the same for all people everywhere. Wish them the same, safe, happy, healthy, free from suffering. A life of ease and well-being. You can open your eyes, but the studies of this, there's, there's now, for example, an institute at Stanford, one at Emory, studying how to expand and enhance people's ability to care about other people, both for kids, for teachers, for principals, for people in business, for everyone, parents. And it turns out that if you do this simple kind of exercise daily, it strengthens that caretaking circuitry, so it comes more naturally to you. So, this is data, I think it's very important for principals. These are leaders who were rated on their leadership style, and then people who work for them were anonymously asked, what's it like to work for this person? And it showed that there are four very positive styles. The visionary, I talked about that, articulating a shared vision. Coaching means caring about the person and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them about them, not about the job, what they want from life, from their career, from this job, how you can help them. Affiliative, having fun together. Democratic, a consensus building leader. And then a two that don't work so well. The pace setter is someone who doesn't give feedback, doesn't do any of the other four, just expects people to be as good as they have been or are and they only give negative appraisals, never positive ones. And then the command and control leader, do it because I say so, I'm the boss. Those have very negative impacts on climate. There was a study commissioned by the uh, United Kingdom Ministry of Education of heads of schools that found that if the head of school had, could exhibit these four positive styles, and you don't, it's not that you're one or the other, you just pull them out as needed in context. And if they had them, then students had highest achievement scores. This is controlling for demographic differences between schools. But what's going on in there, they say, in the black box is how the head of school affects the teachers and how well the teachers are teaching. So, the dynamic is that the head of the school sets the tone, and that affects everyone else. Let me wrap up 
with uh, first five steps for getting better at this. One is asking yourself, do you care? If you don't, it's not going to help. The second is to get an impartial look at what you're good at and what you could get better at. The third is to pick the one you want to work on, like maybe tuning into people, listening, having a full attention when they come to you. And the fourth is having a partner that you're learning with because you're going to have a bad day when you're under pressure, you feel time pressured, and you want to use that as a learning opportunity. And the fifth is practicing at every opportunity that it comes along naturally. And uh, it might be at home, may not be at school, but you're going to remind yourself to tune in and listen. Cross your arms, please. This is what a habit feels like. Now cross them the other way. That's what it's like to change a habit. So it's going to be a little unnatural at first, but keep doing it because one day our research shows if you keep doing it at every opportunity, you do it in the right way at the right time with the right person without having to think about it. That's a neural landmark. It means your brain has strengthened the circuitry for the new habit and it's your new default uh, railway in the brain. Let me finish with a, a story. I started emotional intelligence with it. Some, some of you may know it. It's about a bus driver on Madison Avenue in New York. It was a hot, humid August day, like happens here, or happened yesterday when we were out at the Smithsonian. It was almost 100 degrees when we came out. In New York City, when it's like that, so humid, people get a little prickly and they have an invisible bubble. Don't talk to me, don't touch me. And I had my bubble, I was waiting for a bus. Bus pulls up. I get in with my bubble intact, and the bus driver did something very unusual. He looked at me and he spoke to me and said, how has your day been? I was a little shocked, but I sat down and my bubble intact. And then I realized he's carrying on a conversation with everyone on the bus. Oh, you're looking for suits, are you? Well, there's a, a great sale at this department store up here on the left. Did you hear about the movie in the, in the cinema on the right? I know the one in Cinema 6 got a great review, but I saw the one in Cinema 3 last night. It's fabulous. Oh, did you hear about the Matisse exhibit in this museum? On and on and on. I realized he was carrying on a conversation with everyone on the bus. And then people get off that bus and he'd say, well, I, I hope your day will be wonderful. And people had burst their bubbles. That guy was an urban saint. He was sending ripples of good feeling through a city that sorely needed them. And the bottom line from that is it does not matter what you're doing ostensibly. What matters is can you make the other person feel better at the end of that interaction? Thank you very much.